Clinton, I had to bring you on with a big intro this week. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's a big show. Clinton, big host. It's, it, 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 it's a really big show. And before we get into it, I have to tell you, as a longtime friend of yours, I am so immensely proud of you. To add, you know, I've watched you come up over the years. Um, you've done so many things. There are so many people out there whose lives you've already affected through your music, and now you are transferring some of your wisdom and your experience through a new book, um, How to Win Big in the Music Industry. And I want to really dig deep because there's so many people out there who want to get in the music industry, and you have so much knowledge and success and your willingness to shift. Um, share it with our audience. I'm, I'm, I'm just so proud of you. So, thank you. Before we go too deep into it, why, why'd you decide to write this book, um, Clinton? Uh, you know, it's funny. So, sometimes I, I wonder like how real I should be when I talk on these kind of interviews, right? Mm -hmm. uh, look, I'm from Boston, so like, all we do is swear, right? Yeah. So. So when I sit there, I'm like, because there's nothing but a bunch of shady motherfuckers out there. Yeah. Like, that's what I want to say, right? And like, I've been in this industry for 20 years. Like, you see me come up, you were already like killing it when I just started, right? So like, you were one of the guys, I'm like, oh man, I need to become his friend, right? So like, <clears throat> all I would see throughout my career, uh, present company excluded, all I would see is like, people were just shady, man. They were just like whack. They were greedy. They were out for self. They were ego driven. And like, you know, we live in a day and age now where these, there's so many people now, there's such an easy entry point to get into music, right? With SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, stream. Like at one point there was like, you had to go through a funnel and then the gatekeepers had to approve you. And then like, they would absolutely you know, promote you to everybody else. But like, I noticed even when I first started, when I was trying to come up and get on, I would notice the psychology of music executives and people in the music business, uh, so much so that I lied my way into success, to be honest. Like, even when I first started, um, I knew that the record industry was so far behind in culture and technology that in, in 1999, in my mom's basement where I lived, Right, I just lied to the music industry and pretended like I had an online crack and radio show, mm -hmm. and I knew that they didn't understand the internet yet, and so that's how I got like Eminem and Common and Cameron and Wu Tang and Talib Kweli and everybody at my mom's house because now when they would come to Boston and do like I jam remember that house, yeah, yeah, and they would come to my mom's basement. My mom would make cookies and we would record over my beats, and I would just do interviews with people because we were all starting out. You know what I mean? So. They didn't know better. So that's how I started. And, you know, the reason I even knew that is because I befriended the local DJ on the big radio station there because I, I never even wanted to be, you know, out in front. I wanted to be the guy behind the scenes that helped everybody else become successful. Um, so when I was a producer and he would tell record labels, hey, my friend Clinton's making these beats. You should listen. I would overhear the phone calls and the label execs would be like, yeah, yeah, cool. Hey, you playing my record? So then I was like, oh, shit. I should just become a DJ because then they'll want to be my friend. So I just... Stop there for a second because this is exactly where I want to go. You, you just dropped so much information, but I know you, Clinton Sparks, the DJ. I remember coming through Boston, going to that same house, and you had the turntables set up, but you were Clinton Sparks, the DJ. Tell us, how did you get into DJ? And was that a deliberate thing? Um, that you sat back and you said to yourself, hey, this is my way in, or was it just a passion and a love for the craft that made you pick up those um, turntables and, and those records? Well, I, I realistically wanted to be a producer and a songwriter. That was my real goal, and, and I was an artist at the time, too. So when I realized, so I, the reason I already knew how to DJ is because since I was like 12 or 11, um, I would hear songs on the radio at that time, I didn't know what a remix was. I would just hear on the weekend, like an extended version of like Prince, right? And then I'd be like, what is this version that plays for seven minutes, right? So then like, I would find like a part that was an instrumental and on my mom's dual cassette deck, I would record and loop that part so that I could just write over that part and come up with new melodies. I'd challenge myself to come up with a whole different song over that melody. So that's really where I wanted to go. But then when I noticed that no, nobody would listen to my beats being like this, 
you know, this white kid from Boston just trying to make hip hop beats. So I was, and I seen how they were all ball sucking my friend to play his rec, to play their records because he was important. Who was your friend? You keep mentioning him. Uh, this kid, Roy Barboza. Oh, Roy. Big shout out to Roy Barboza. Right. So, you know, I hang up at the radio station and I would just understand and learn the business of radio and you know, record labels and like the, how they work together. So, I mean, I started, most people don't know, my first radio gig is I used to write all the funny skits for the morning show in Boston on Jam 94.5. So I was like the guy that would run out in the streets and do all the funny bits. Uh, so that's how I started my radio business. And was then, it uh, paid? Uh, was it? I don't recall. I don't remember. Uh, the only reason I ask you that is because, you know, many people, and this is something I drive home in so many of my interviews and whenever I speak um, in public, many people do not like to start from the bottom. They think they're above that. They think well, that's, that they, that's today. That's today. Yes, it, exactly. So when, when I interview successful people like yourselves, I love, like yourself, I love to, to just take a pause for a second because getting into the music industry is set up to keep people out. Like, let's just call it what it is. It's a very small industry. Millions of people around the globe want to be in this industry. And it's just not enough jobs. It's not enough work. So you have to kind of be creative and find your way into it. Well, to your point, they want to be in the industry, the shiny part of it. They don't understand. They don't understand people like you and me. We don't see our family. We don't see our kids. We do have to travel all the time. We are lonely a lot. We, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot. Look, at, I always say this. If you want a job that has no guaranteed pay, no overtime, no retirement plan, no health benefits, and you never, ever know if you'll ever make money, get in the music business. Be honest, right? So, but if you believe in yourself and you're willing to have the patience and you're willing to work really hard and you're willing to do mad shit for free, right? Then that's what it takes to really succeed in the music business. Now, today is a little bit different because it's a little bit more instant gratification. You can make a dope record, then go slap somebody on camera and you go viral and everyone checks out your music because you did some wild shit, mm -hmm. right? But it's like, and like, look, those are marketing tactics, right? That some people do, like look at people like 6 9 You know what I mean? They go and they troll the internet so you just, so the light points at them and then they say, now listen to my music. Right? So like you decide whether it's smart or it's not and whether it's sustainable. And we're realizing it's not sustainable because one of the things I always say is, you know, overnight success takes 10 years. However, most overnight success doesn't last 10 years. Correct. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.